thank you very much. Uh, and, you know, Julia definitely uh, did a great job of giving me an intro there. So as she mentioned, um, I am the stack lead uh, of uh, one of the teams here at Catchpoint, and I'm also an architect. And I've been with Catchpoint for uh, a little over a decade now. Um, I joined them as a, you know, early stage startup and I, and I stayed around. But that was also something I wanted to do, and that's actually been uh, part of my growth path as well. So um, when Julia came to me and said, hey, can you put this together? I, got, I sat down and I really thought about this, and I managed to distill down my, my survival guide. So this is really my journey. Uh, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what all I learned along the way and it's been a journey of 35 years. Um, there's a lot of things I learned a long time ago and I started doing, but I would say ever since uh, just in the last 18 months, I really was able to level up and start really accelerating this transformation. So um, let's just jump in and get going with this. So. You know, what are the problems of being both a leader and a developer? So this is what I've, you know, what I really started coming to terms with. So first of all, um, how do I manage my time between leadership and engineering tasks? Uh, there's always a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, how do I split my time? How should I split my time? And really, it begged the better, bigger question of how much time do I really have? Um, you know, and the next one, this kind of led to the next one. Okay, so how do I select the appropriate things to work on? Uh, because I've already learned the hard lesson of if I pick up something that's too big uh, or I, you know, or I get myself busy looking at something deeply, I'm impacting my team. So all of a sudden, I'm no longer a leader. Now I'm offline being a coder. And I can't really do that. You know, what is it that I need to work on? What should I delegate? Uh, how do I decide between that? Uh, what do I keep and, you know, what do I uh, hand off? Should I even bother doing development anymore? Uh, you know, and the other question came out of this, you know, when do I need to put down the keyboard? as I you know, started realizing to myself. And another really important thing that came out of this was, do I think I'm the only one who can do this or do something? And if so, why do I think that? And I really had to start digging deep and looking into that. And the final question that came out of this for myself also was, how do I clearly set expectations with my team and my stakeholders? Uh, because I've got to clearly articulate my challenges to my team, to my stakeholders. Um, what are the cultural attitudes that I need to either overcome or I need to work within? You know, because every shop you work in uh, does have some kind of cultural model that they operate under. And sometimes it can be, you know, sometimes there can be negative aspects to it. Sometimes there's a lot of positive aspects to it. So, you know, what do I need to do to, to transform myself within that and still fit? And another very important point that came up out of this was, you know, for myself was, are there company values that I still need to uphold? So if I transform myself into somebody who can do this, you know, do both leadership and coding, but I'm not going to be able to code as much, you know, what are my, you know, what, what are those company values I have to uphold still? And also that goes back to communication. So what are the challenges presented by being both a leader and a developer? Um, I picked this graphic because this is some, you know, this is how I felt for years, just like everything's a blur. <laughs> Everything I'm being pulled in so many different directions, but you know, what does it really boil down to? You know, what are the challenges? I really identified four key things for myself. 
that I realized these were all the things that I always had to come up against. What are the expectations of my team and my stakeholders? You know, breaking those things down. My stakeholders have an expectation that I'm a resource and I can code. Okay, so I need to, you know, I need to service that. Uh, I need to still deliver work in a timely manner. I need to be available to my team for technical leadership duties. I need to be available to my other stakeholders because I'm pulled in to meetings for technical oversight, for input, for project scoping. I still also have to oversee technical leadership and processes to deliver the work products, you know, for delivering our products out to the customers. And in some shops, and there may be some folks on the call here who dealt with this before too, but in some shops, the technical lead also does double duty as a full-time project manager. So in the shops where I've been, that's been an even bigger challenge. And that goes back to those expectations. And then this has been a constant over the last 30 odd years, uh, the tendency of my time to be very interrupt driven uh, constantly. And it's a constant thing, constantly getting multiple inputs and requests. Uh, I get sidetracked, I get pulled into something, uh, you know, something just pops up and I go and jump on it. And that can be very, uh, you know, impactful to my productivity. Uh, but that was one of those other challenges. And that kind of led to this other one of competing priorities. So, okay, I've got this one team asking me about this one thing. I got another team asking me about another thing, and I'm not sure who I pick first. Or I'm confronted with a, a bunch of work that needs to be delivered by a certain time, and everything has the same priority. So how do I come up with what the tactical priorities are? How do I, you know, which one is first? What sequence do I do stuff in? Um, and where do they fit on that urgent and important matrix? Uh, you probably know what I'm talking about, but this is like that famous, uh, I think it was Covey, uh, uh, from Covey Time Management of how you, you know, where things fall in terms of the, dimensions of important and urgent. So how do I fit all that? And then finally, the last one, uh, which is how do I be in multiple places at once? Um, how do I balance those conflicts? A lot of times I get pulled into multiple meetings or I'll get, you know, there's competing things for my time. Uh, it really brought up the big question of how do I scale myself? And you know, once I really came to these realizations, um, that's when I had an epiphany. I had to stop the madness because I was driving myself bonkers, trying to keep up with all of these different things. And what I had to realize, you know, and, and this is why I put the subtitle here, how I learned to live and love and thrive in the chaos because Chaos is a part of our everyday life. I, and I don't mean chaos in a negative way. I mean chaos here in the fact that there is so much going on. Like what Julia was alluding to, that information is, you know, growing in the world at an exponential rate. So there's always going to be something going on. When I finally sat down and I realized this whole thing with, I need to stop. I've got to breathe. I need to figure out what to do. A couple of key things came out of this. The number, you know, first one is pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. I was suffering. I was going through pain and I was suffering. So I knew I had to complete a journey with pain, but I had to stop the suffering. And this also means that sometimes pain has to be spread around. But that's not a negative thing. You know, as the saying goes, no pain, no gain. So we had, I had to transform and I had to transform those around me. Other great realizations, I had to get out of my own way. So part of this was just my attitudes. I also realized I really truly had to work smarter, not harder, not that as a cliche, because, you know, I've heard that, you know, joked about in other shops as a cliche, but it's really true. I had 
to find a way to really work more intelligently and not just simply try to put in more hours or write code faster or review documents faster, whatever. I also finally had to realize <laughs> my own limitations. I am just one person. I have limitations. Uh, and, you know, so this was where the transformation really began. So what did I learn out of this stuff? All the painful lessons. And a lot of this is stuff that I've learned over the last 30 years, but a number of things I really started to grasp upon after I went through that great training that uh, Julia was talking about at the top of the presentation. Um, that was like the transformative moment for me because it gave me a whole additional set of tools that I was able to really accelerate my transformation. So what are the great realizations that I learned with everything here? Um, first of all, I can't do everything. As much as I may think I'm Superman, I'm not. I just can't do everything. I can't be everywhere. Just can't, it's not possible. Uh, as much as I may want to. I can't be in the critical path. This one was really important to grasp and understand because I've already seen the negative thing that happens. I end up blocking my team. I really can't pick up any big engineering work anymore. I can't do that. I still want to code, but I can't do the big stuff anymore. The other thing too, I don't have infinite time. You know, I, 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 uh, I won't say that I was necessarily delusional, but I was definitely fooling myself that somehow I could magically make more time appear in my day. Uh, and no, that doesn't happen. Uh, we all get 24 hours a day and that's it. I also don't have infinite resources. Uh, what that really means is I came to discover too, I, you know, I don't have infinite patience. I can't just, you know, deal with every single uh, problem and event that comes my way. I don't have the availability to look at everything that's that's happening. I just can't, you know, it goes back to what my other ones are. I can't be everywhere. I can't do everything. Um, so that means I had to really, you know, understand those key things to get myself to a point of where can I change? It really just meant I don't know everything. I, I really don't. Uh, this was the other key thing. And I think one of the things that plagues a lot of us who are in technology for a very long time is we do tend to accumulate a lot of knowledge and experience. And I found myself in a position where I had really thought, you know what, I know everything I need to ever know to do my job. I was wrong. I don't know everything. This is what opened up the final door for realizing this big thing here. I do not scale. I can't clone myself. I can't create another few copies of me. Um, what it means, and this is what was, you know, this was some of the empowerment and education and knowledge that I got from some of the education I got recently, that I really have to look to my team and leverage the power of the team and amplify them. And I really like that term amplify. What can I impart from knowledge, experience, wisdom to make them more than they are today and really help me and help them? Uh, you know, and I intentionally chose this graphic because these are famous Chinese acrobats. And you notice that they're spinning a lot of plates in the air. Well, I think this is apropos because my team can definitely keep 
many, many more plates in the air than I can by myself. So I have to do this. I have, I have to transform myself. There's just no, no choice. So what can I do as a leader? <laughs> so that was the next thing. All right, what do I do? How do I transform? Well, I can work harder or longer. That's not good because I'm already stressed as it is. You know, I was already stressed. I was already regularly putting in regular overtime as it was. Um, you can't really work harder. I mean, how do you code harder? I mean, I'm already coding, you know, pretty fast. I'm already doing my other work pretty fast. So, you know, I can't do that and I can't certainly put in more time. I mean, I could, but I'm just going to hurt myself more. Um, well, can I cut corners and take shortcuts? <laughs> no, because if I do that, yeah, I might be saving some time here and there, but now I'm not doing my job. Or even worse, I'm impacting quality. I'm impacting customers. I'm impacting my company. Uh, I'm impacting my stakeholders. I'm impacting my team. I'm impacting everybody around me. I can't do that. That's not good. Um, well, can I give up coding completely? Well, not really. I mean, that's one of my big strong suite, you know, strong suits. I am an engineer. I've got a lot of experience and knowledge there, and it's a very strong technical skill. So I can't give it up, not completely. So I got to do something. Um, all right, well, can I give up being a technical leader? Not really. I thought about that. Can I step down from it? But if I do, all of a sudden, I'm taking a whole lot of skill sets off the plate because I've got a lot of good skills as a leader. Uh, mentoring, uh, oversight, guidance, uh, feedback, review, design. I mean, it's a very long list. So I can't give up on that either. You know, and then, well, maybe can I do some kind of combination of all these? Well, the answer is no, I can't. I mean, all of these things are off the table. Um, I got to do something different. So here's my survival guide. This is what I finally realized uh, that I had to do. And these are the actions I took and what I ended up doing to transform myself and amplify myself and also amplify my team and really, you know, make, make the difference. One of the key things that I didn't put on a previous slide is that I realized I had to ask for help. And it takes a lot of courage, especially in the very competitive space that we work as technical people, to really say, you know, reach out and say, hey, you know what? I need help. I don't know how to do this, and I'm drowning. I need something. Well, I got that help. Um, like I said, I figured out a lot on my own over the course of a long career, but the key things really came in when I had the training that I did last year. And that was what put the final puzzle pieces into place and gave me a box of tools that really helped me make this happen. So I've broken this down into three main areas. What did I have to do? Well, number one, I had to take control of my time. That was out of control because I felt like I was being, you know, I was the, you know, I was the tail and I was being wagged by the dog. <laughs> um, I felt just out of control there. I needed to empower my team. So what did I need to do? I just couldn't dump a whole bunch of responsibilities on them because a lot of them, they didn't know how to do. 
So what did I need to do to help them take over responsibilities so that I could amplify what they do and also make it possible for them to be more productive and also be smarter? And finally, the last one was I had to maintain my sanity. So like I talked about, you know, previous slide, I was like going in all these different directions. So I had to do something, you know, what did I have to do to really bring about bringing myself to center and having every day make every day a great day. That was, that was it, you know. I had to find that good work-life balance. So let's jump in and I'm going to walk everyone through what I did to take control of my time. And so I'm going to definitely throw a shout out here to uh, Julia and her partner, Alan, for their great uh, uh, engineering, uh, uh, the Exceptional Engineering Experience course, because that was what really opened my eyes to doing this. I've gone through a lot of time management training, and I've put a lot of those things into practice, but this was like the final piece that made it all possible to transform this. So the first thing I started doing was I had to track where I was spending my time. That one was really important. Where was all of my time going? Project work, meetings, interruptions, business related things, personal things, you know, taking lunch, you know, where was all of my time going? So once I was able to start measuring that, I had to also start calculating, and I put it in capital letters here because I really want to call this out as a, as a, as a concept that I had to really wrap my head around. And that is I had to calculate what are my available hours in a week that I can truly accomplish work. And I couldn't do that until I started knowing where my time was going. The next thing was, you know, because of that, and because I started tracking my data, I had to get real. And what this means is I had to really start doing something which is realistic planning. Uh, you know, a lot of planning that I was doing before and a lot of what happens in the industry is we all plan for like a best case scenario and we plan this happy path. Uh, I had to turn that on its head. I had to really do realistic planning. How long does it realistically take me to do something? I had to start, and this is all about where I'm spending my time. So I had to get my head wrapped around that. The next thing I had to do, and, and this was something that I've learned in other time management, but the exceptional engineering course really brought it home in a new fine point to me. I had to plan my work and work my plan. And it also introduced me to this reality that I have to make hard choices. Again, back to that realization I pointed out earlier, I can't do everything. No, I really can't. I've only got so much time. So what can I realistically do? And that means, boy, I really want to do these two things, but I got to make a choice to put one of them down, even though I may really want to be the one who does that. I can't. I might even have to make the choice that, you know what, I can't do either of those things because I got something third that came in that I need to do that's important. And I'm just going to have to let my team do these other things. So what else did that lead to? You know, what else did I have to do in taking control of my time? Um, out of all of that, the other thing that I had to do to combat the whole point uh, of being constantly interrupted is I started using focus time. Now, this was another concept that really came up in the training that I did, but I've heard this before and I've used it off and on over the past like 25 years. But I didn't quite use it the way that the exceptional course taught me to use it. Um, so now what I do is I just create blocks of time on my calendar called focus time that 
I then work my plan inside of. This is when I get real work done. I turn off my messaging systems or I put them on do not disturb. I turn off my, you know, I silence my phone. Um, I may turn off my email system, you know, Outlook, so it's not popping up and telling me I got an email so that I can sit down and really do the deep dive into something and be uninterrupted for an extended period of time. And a lot of times my focus time is like one hour blocks, might be two hour blocks. It just really depends, but I can really sprint and focus during that time. And one of the big things that I started to learn out of that was just how expensive context switching is for us human beings. So one of the things that we definitely know that research has shown is that human beings are terrible at multitasking. Our brains are not wired for that. We do not naturally multitask. Um, there was a study, I was reading a study here not too long ago that was saying that for, on average, for human beings, context switching costs you about 15 or, tw you know, 15 to 20 minutes, I think it was. Uh, I'm not quoting an exact figure there. I'm just, you know, stating from memory. But it really goes to indicate just how expensive an interruption is. Now, that's not to say that sometimes interruptions are not important because there's a lot of times they are. Something critical is happening at a company, you know, at your work, whatever, you got to jump on it. Okay. But all things being equal, you can focus. The next thing I started doing was I used my data that I was gathering to decide what development work I can realistically do. So I'm still gonna I'm still gonna do engineering work, but what is it that I can now do? Because now I know how much time I've actually got available to myself. Um, that's what guided me on how I pick up stuff and what it is I pick up. Um, I also periodically do a self retrospective to improve because I look back at my plan. What went, you know, what was good? What was bad? What could I do better? Um, I had more interruptions than I expected. Okay, how do I need to adjust? So that was something that I really learned recently too. And that's been very powerful to me. And the other thing that I did is I now keep my own personal database of ideas of how I can improve what I do, my own personal processes for managing all this stuff. So as my days go by and I realize, you know what, I need to start scheduling myself some time on my calendar to do this other thing regularly, or I need to remove this meeting, or I need to try getting rid of that, you know, getting rid of that meeting or changing how I do focus time, or maybe I can automate something. All of that goes into this bucket of ideas. And I periodically go and look at it every time I do a plan, you know, because I got to plan my work. So I'm going to show you one of the little tools I cooked up here. And I've actually shared this with my team. Um, this is a screenshot of a spreadsheet that I created to calculate my available hours in a given week. And this is like the fourth, fourth or fifth iteration of this. And this was kind of the latest one I did back in March, March of this year, 2021. And I took uh, all of where all my current meetings and all the various other kind of daily overhead things were, and I just put them onto this time calendar and then added in all of the unplanned work that popped up on my radar uh, over the previous several months. And it ended up that based upon like, you know, what you can see there in that one column, I had an average of about seven and a half hours per week of things that was unplanned, you know, unplanned things. And this was everything, interruptions of some kind or getting called into a meeting, you know, an ad hoc meeting or dealing with some kind of, you know, important customer related issue 
or servicing something that my team needed from me. All of that just was stuff that was not part of anything I planned. So I had to bucket, you know, I had to plan for this in my week. So ultimately, I ended up arriving at the reality that I have about 14 and a half hours a week that I can get work done. Now, I did some other things too, and I'll talk about that here in just a minute because you see some notes here. But um, I originally started off optimistically thinking I had about 20 hours of time a week because I figured, yeah, about half my week was going to meetings and such. No, that wasn't right. Once I really started tracking it, it was a lot more than I expected. I think that's the great, that's one of the great realizations I had is, um, and I can impart this to everybody, you're probably spending more time than you think you are. <laughs> I sure was. Um, so once I started with 20 hours, I ultimately converged to where I am right there at 14 and a half. And today, I don't have a new spreadsheet to show you, but today I'm actually at about 16 hours because I did some streamlining by changing some meetings to be asynchronous. In other words, I don't have to meet them in person anymore or on a Zoom call or something like that. We can actually just post updates to one another in our chat system and that works quite well so you know again using my time data um one of the great realizations that came out of this the great aha moments the epiphanies um first of all i now know that i have approximately 16 hours per week available for project work and that stays pretty steady Sometimes I can get in a few more hours. Sometimes it's a little bit less, but that stays pretty steady for me. Um, the second thing is I split that available time about 60-40 between leadership and engineering work because the other thing that I realized by tracking my data and where my time is going is that I wasn't really putting in enough time in where I was supposed to be doing it, which is leadership. And leadership does have, you know, there's work that you have to do. It takes time to do leadership things. I had initiatives to do. I had training things to work out. I had documentation to write, all kinds of things. So I finally realized that I had to split, I had to put a little bit more in the leadership bucket than I do in the engineering bucket. But I made sure that I still have time in my engineering bucket. And finally, what that means is that in general, I ended up with having approximately six hours a week that I can apply to engineering work. And in particular, it had to be low priority, non-blocking engineering tasks. So in other words, I can't pick up that big feature that's important, that must be delivered in the next release that 100 customers are wanting. No, I can't do that. Uh, I can consult on it. I can give input on its design, but I can't be the one who's actually doing the work. No, I pick out these little small things that are really just background work that if I can't get it finished, it's not gonna block anybody. It's not gonna really negatively impact the product in any great way. But I still am able to get some of the engineering work done and do some of that leadership by example that I need to do as a technical leader. So this wraps up all of the kind of big things that I did on how I took control of my time. The next big area is, all right, what did I do to empower my team? Now, some of these things I started years ago because these were things I already knew and I knew I needed to do it. But again, critical mass point happened last year where some new tools came, I became aware of them, and I was able to really accelerate this and start to amplify. Um, 
I refined and documented processes that I was doing by hand myself regularly. Um, I was overseeing a lot of releases, you know, I was overseeing a lot of things, you know, that's like technical administrative management, but I didn't have it documented down into a process. And one of the things that we all know from, uh, you know, businesses is for a business to be successful, you document your processes because then it's possible for other people to repeat it. So I started doing that. That was the first thing. Write down what I was doing so other people could start doing it. I started delegating specific technical authority and responsibilities to my sub leads. Um, here at Catchpoint, our teams are organized into smaller sub teams. We refer to them as squads. So each one of these squads has a technical leader that's responsible for what that particular squad is doing. They are a subdivision of the entire team. So I started delegating a lot of certain technical authority and responsibilities down to them. You now have to have oversight over these modules, this particular aspect of the team. This is your domain of control and authority and such like that. Um, I then also, uh, and this is again, some of the stuff I did years ago, but I started refining it even more. I started delegating a lot of specific technical processes to the entire team, and I did it on a fair sort of round robin basis. Uh, as an example, now this is one of the things that I set up a number of years ago, was um, we needed to have the concept of an on-call engineer who could be the first one to deal with any incoming high priority customer issues. Uh, because previously, I was usually the go-to person. And so this was one of those first aha moments that, you know, we need to make this fair and it becomes an opportunity for the entire team to learn, to grow, and we get to spread it around the team. So everybody gets to take a turn at this and it really is a good thing for them to also get this experience. So that was one of the things as an example. The other thing that I've done is um, our release process is um, a bit involved and has some complexity to it. And this was one of those things that I documented the entire process. And now I assigned um, another rotation for a role of release manager. So one of the senior engineers on the team uh, becomes the release manager for a given release and has to oversee all of those duties. And again, great experience. And it doesn't mean that I'm the one doing it all the time because that's exactly what was happening. I was the one doing it all the time. The final thing, you know, final thing I was doing here was, uh, and this is something I definitely started doing early this year, I started encouraging the team to track their own data. You know, I started seeing the power of it for myself. So I started telling them, track what you're doing because it will open your eyes. Uh, I actually kicked off a pilot project where one of the new tools I was introduced to, um, we've rolled it out to part of the team and they are successfully using it. And they're starting to see the benefits of that and they're starting to use their own data to make smarter decisions and to make more realistic planning. So that was another huge thing. Um, but that's not all. More. A um, couple things that I recently did that really started making this whole thing really take, take shape. I removed myself from minor decision-making processes. Uh, I found that I was being called into too many things to make too many decisions that really could be handled tactically. It means I had to trust my team. And that was one of the things I had to overcome. There was a fear I had. Um, and I had to realize, you know what, I can't have that fear. I have to trust my team. I have to teach them where there are areas where they don't know as well. But otherwise, I have to trust them. In a lot of cases, it means I had to do more documentation. I had to provide a, 
provide a framework or I had to give them, you know, I had to define some success criteria, but I had to really just offload that to themselves. I had to also remove myself from constant code and design reviews. That was something where I was really getting pigeonholed because everybody wanted my input. I can't do that anymore. In fact, here just recently, I said, quit assigning me to reviews. I'm not gonna do them anymore. Instead, I will tell you if I wanna review something. Um, I now do drive-by reviews, what I call drive-by reviews, and I do them as educational tools to just point out something that maybe you know got missed. Um, I had to start some training programs to improve the skills across the team universally. You know, as the saying goes, a rising tide floats all boats. That's what I had to do. I had to make the tide rise. I had to amplify. And so I've started doing that. Um, I realized that, you know, I was taking on a lot myself because of that. And so this means I have, you know, now that I'm delegating more to the team, I've got to train them where there's certain deficiencies and it's working. We're making good progress and they're learning and a lot of people are having these aha moments themselves. The final thing was the hardest thing for me to learn. And this is really goes back, you have to have, I learned for myself, I had to have a lot of patience and emotional intelligence to do this. I have to let my team fail so that they can learn. Because one of my common reactions was I would jump in and rescue people. I would save them from myself, you know, save them from themselves. Oh, I'll finish that work for you because you're not really familiar with that. No, I can't do that. You need to figure that out. Failure's the great teacher. That was the big aha moment out of this. And it really brought about some other cultural change on the, on the team. For example, you know, we are software developers. I had to do, I had to decriminalize defects because people were afraid they were gonna get blamed. We had to stop that. No more blame game. You know, failure happens. We're human beings, we're fallible. Let's take this and use it as a learning tool. So by decriminalizing it, it opened up this opportunity now for us to all explore what did we do wrong? How did we miss this? What can we do better? How can we prevent this in the future? So this has been some great, you know, some great things have really happened out of this. So I, I'm coming up, you know, pushing up against my time limit here. So I'll kind of quickly go through the last block of stuff. How I improve my communication. So a lot of this, I already pretty well communicate uh, as a leader. That's just one of those skills I had to develop as a leader going back, you know, nearly 30 years. But I had to improve it even more. So one of the biggest things I did was I realized I needed to set up, and I've thought about this a long time, but I had to set up regular office hours. So instead of being interrupt driven, now I set up a regular block of time, uh, four days out of the week where everybody can just drop by and ask questions, technical questions, whatever, bring your problems, bring your questions. And it has been a huge success. And in fact, other teams at Catchpoint are starting to use this model as well, because it really is empowering, because it not only helps me manage time better, but it also helps the people who drop by because they also get to hear things that they might not normally hear. And there's been a lot of refinement of it because it's had, you know, it's had its, it's, had its ebbs and flows. Um, I also, this was actually a trick I picked up out of the four hour work week book. Uh, and I can't think of the author of it, but it was something that I read there. And I thought, you know, this is a great technique. So I also blocked out in my calendar every day about four or five 15 minute intervals, uh, you know, basically booking a, you know, booking a meeting with myself to handle emails and messages. And what I discovered by doing that is I'm able to stay on top of all the messaging systems where I get input. I can stay on top of my emails. I can respond to things. I can answer questions in our messaging system. We happen to use Microsoft Teams, but if you use Slack, you know, it could be Slack, it could be any of these systems. 
Um, and if there's like really big stuff that shows up in there that's going to take me a while, well, then I have the choice of blocking out time on my calendar. Or if it's not urgent, it goes under my product, you know, it goes under my project plan for next week. So I know I can take care of it. I can follow up. I can regularly, I can make commitments that, yeah, I'll get an answer back to you by this date. So that was really great without, with all of that. This is something that's already been there, but it's also helped really improve all of this. Having regular one-on-ones one, one -on with my sub leads and with the key management people. So that way I'm keeping a clear line of communication and I still have ongoing communication also through regular messaging channels, which was the next one. I keep a regular standing, you know, we have regular standing chat channels and meetings and I use those now, I leverage those to the advantage of keeping regular group communication going on. And in fact, one of the big things that has transformed is I have a standing team weekly meeting. So now, instead of it just being like a status meeting, we actually use the first part of it only as kind of like a quick status update and me just telling, you know, informing the team of anything that's happening at the technical management level. But I use the rest of the meeting as an opportunity to do uh, learning, education, presentation. Um, it's a venue for discussion and education. And that's really been hugely useful. And so now we all look forward to that. We regularly record it. It's a great place to do that. And we even have a backlog of topics. Uh, we have tech talks that we print, you know, pre, you know, uh, present in that. There's actually more stuff to present there than we have time to do, but that's a good thing. <clears throat> Final thing is, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. Final thing was I had to retain my sanity. Uh, I was being pulled seven ways from Sunday, constantly. I had to bring myself back to center, back to my place of Zen, back to, back to calm, back to a place of peace and tranquility where I know that I can accomplish what I need to do. And and everything is going to work out the way it needs to work out. So what did I do? I now keep a regular schedule. In addition to all of my time management and taking control of my time, I now keep myself to a pretty strict, I start my day by this time, I end my day by this time. For me, uh, I keep, I'm here in Arizona, I keep New York hours. My day starts at 7.30 a.m. and I pretty much regularly end it at 4.30 p.m. every day, sometimes give or take 10 or 20 minutes, but I keep a regular schedule. That has been huge for my mental health. I have managed to maintain a much better work-life balance because of that, and I still get things done that I need to do. The second thing, practice good self-care. I mean, this is kind of obvious, but there were times where I was so stressed out, all I wanted to do is plock myself in front of the TV and eat junk food. Well, that's not healthy. So I now make sure I get in exercise, I eat good, I, I get rest, I do my hobbies, I have diversions that take my mind off of work, you know? And that goes to the next thing. I had to learn how to turn off and unplug. That one's hard. Put down the phone, turn off the phone, put down the iPad, you know, turn off. It'll be there tomorrow. Um, I had to keep myself flexible to change and be adaptable. I used to get really stressed when everything, when something unexpected popped up in my week. No longer. I now know that change is inevitable. Change is going to happen. It's the only, you know, as the saying goes, change is the only true constant. And so, I now know I have to be adaptable and I will be. And that's what I've done. Um, I have, I, I strive to listen more and be more open. That's, that's still a work in progress. Um, I stay positive. 
that's the other thing. I used to have I used to have some negative attitudes about a lot of things. Gosh, I can't get any work done. I'm so busy with this. I'm so busy with that. And it really set up a, you know, quite a negative attitude for myself. This is where I had to learn to get out of my own way. I keep positive. I assume positive intent. People are not out to hurt me. <laughs> you know, things are not out to destroy me. This is, you know, this is what life is about. You know, I have to adapt and roll with the changes. All of us probably experienced this last year when COVID happened. I had to adapt as well. So that's been a big lesson. The final big learning. Sorry, I jumped ahead. This is a messy thing. It's messy. Uh, I'm not perfect at this. It's a constant work in progress. I'm constantly learning and adapting. I'm constantly asking for feedback and I'm constantly being open to it. I experiment with ideas. Keep those that work. I discard that those don't. I collaborate a lot more now with my team and with management for ideas. I keep myself open to feedback. Somebody says, hey, this isn't working. Okay, what can we do better? Um, but it's messy. But what I'm not gonna give everybody is the secret of how I keep my shirt so clean when I'm handling that much paint. So on that moment, thank you everybody.